Welcome back. I'm Connie Sokol, your host of Call to Create, and I am so delighted to have our wonderful guest this week, Jeanette Bennett. Thanks for being in studio with us. Connie, I love spending time with you, and I'm excited to chat today about all good things. I am too. And I was cracking up because beforehand, you know, we like to be authentic here. And when I say in studio, I mean in my studio, in my home, she is in her home and I'm fixing the lighting and any creative at home knows what this is like, but you, the light's coming in wrong and I'm putting up the poster thing and I'm trying to tweak it so that it works right. I just want you to know that even when you're in the game for a while, it's still like that on the back end. So we are going to get so real today with sweet Jeanette Bennett. She is a dear friend of many years and she is so well known and beloved loved, especially in our beautiful state of Utah. So I'm going to give the official bio, and then we're going to jump into our kitchen table conversation, the stories, the ups, the downs, the highs and lows of being a business owner and creating this space in business. So let me give you the, the downloads. Jeanette Bennett started Utah Valley Magazine 24 years ago. I can't believe that's so amazing with a big vision and a big love for the community. She has grown the company to include Business Q Magazine, Utah Valley Bride, the UV50 and Parade of Homes magazines around the state. Jeanette earned her bachelor's and master's degree in communications from BYU, and she was awarded an honorary doctorate in business from UVU. Earlier this year, Jeanette was inducted into the Silicon Slopes Hall of Fame, and in 2018, she was named Top Woman Entrepreneur in Media during a luncheon in New York City along with Martha Stewart. Jeanette is the chair-elect of the United Way of Utah County and has recently joined the board of Thanksgiving Point as chief visionary officer. Jeanette is the mother of five, a cancer survivor, a Relief Society president, a former state Senate candidate, and a cheerleader for Utah. All right, let's dive in. Let's My dear it. friend, let's go back to that beginning because I have always been curious and in our lunches, we've never like gone nitty gritty about this kind of stuff. What was it that even motivated you to do a magazine. That's a huge undertaking. So what was it that compelled you to do that? You know, it was, and I was 25 years old at the time and I have kids that age now. And I'm like, wow, how did I think that I was ready for this <laughs> and that I knew how the world worked? Cause I definitely did not. But really the genesis of it was I went to BYU, studied journalism, worked at the papers there, and then worked at the New Era magazine, worked at the Deseret News. And then I became a mom. And this was in 1997, before there was work from home possibilities, technology was very different. And I worked as a copy editor at the Deseret News until the day I became a mom. I told them I would be back in six weeks, but the reality of it was I didn't want to. Once I had that babe in my arms, and this was a downtown Salt Lake, 10 or 11 hour a day type of job, I was like, I cannot do that. And, and for some people, that is the right answer. Just for me, it was like, what other options are there? And, and what I came to was that being an entrepreneur was going to be my way to do this. And so I, I probably wouldn't have become an entrepreneur if I hadn't become a mom, because that's what necessitated that desire for autonomy, autonomy of location of work, time of work, spreading it out, holding a baby while you work. And women have better options today. But at the time, I didn't feel like I had a lot of great options that allowed me to do all the things that I really cared about. And so it was at that point that the entrepreneurial light bulb turned on. And I had gotten a minor in business at BYU. I, I loved business, but I thought I would write about it. I didn't think I would start one. Isn't that fabulous? And I love that is so true for so many women that that mother necessity, because they still feel the, the pull and the draw, almost being that call to do something, be a mom and that you find the way to do it. And there's the solutions start coming. And then you pave the way for other people coming behind you to be able to say, oh yeah, now we have these options, which, you know, 20, 30 years ago, just were not that readily available. So what was the vision for the magazine you had? That's a Betsy move. What did you ultimately want to do with that? So there was something that was a precursor to Utah Valley Magazine, and it was this national newsletter, and we don't do it anymore, but it was this idea that did work, and we made a few thousand dollars on it, and what it did is it gave me a a little bit of a ramp. So I figured out how to get a business license, how to pay sales tax, how to use bulk mail without anyone really paying attention because it was just this small little project. And then in 2000, when we decided we're doing this, we sold our house. We had a little bit of equity. We sold our house, moved back into an apartment to print that first issue. I had two babies at this point. I had a newborn and a two-year-old and I was just 
I don't know, it was exciting. And when I look back, I think God really did pave the way and give me the confidence and open some doors that I really hadn't earned or deserved at that point. And I think that I really was supposed to do this. I, I feel like this was part of my divine plan and and good things have come from it for me and hopefully for others. And so I feel like he was really generous. I do feel like right before that first issue came out, I got asked to do so many things, take meals to so many people, go do this welfare project, go do this temple thing. And my husband and I were saying yes, because I was like, we're asking God for a lot of help right now. And maybe he's just trying to see if we'll also help him, you know, if there can be that type of relationship. And so I look back on that really intense period right before that first issue launched. And I think that there was a lot of God testing me and me relying on him. And it really kind of set the foundation for how I feel about the company and the partnership that I have with heaven to do it. That's so gorgeous. I've heard you share that in our conversations over the many years, that that red thread that goes through it of your partnership with him in order to make this happen. And I've, I've seen you be able to say, what about this? No. Okay. Yes. How do we work that? And really make him part of that CEO experience. Mm -hmm. What have been some of those go-to tools for you to be able to keep that, make that happen and sustain that? Because when you're in business, it can be so hard to not go off on strange roads, or there's always the next big thing and the next big person and finding, following their model or following their way. And there's lots of great bits, right? Best out of the best books. But how have you been able to stay centered in that? Any tools or tips that you've been able to do to keep partnering with him? Right. And it, it hasn't been a linear road. We've definitely made mistakes and gone after projects that didn't work out and all of that. But I will say there have been a few things. One is, so when we started, I did feel that reliance on God. I was 25, didn't know what I didn't know, had no network. I didn't know anyone, not related to anyone like, yeah. in a high position to help me. And so we prayed a lot and we continue to say prayers at our monthly staff meetings. And I know that's maybe a little unusual. And uh, when we have a new person join the company, we ask them how they feel and if they would be comfortable. And we have had mostly LDS, but some non-LDS through the years and have allowed all types of prayers, you know, encouraged all types of prayers to be said. And basically the reason that I've kept doing that is I feel that we wouldn't have gotten off the ground without him. And I feel that if we stop asking for help and thanking him for his help, that we're saying to him, we don't need you anymore. And I don't feel that way. I feel that we do need him. <laughs> and so we've continued to do that. And I, you know, I hope nobody will sue me over it, but I just feel that he deserves gratitude and I want him to know we are still relying on him. So that's one thing that has really helped. I think one thing we've been fortunate with, and this doesn't work for every business model, but we don't have outside investors. And so we're not beholden to anyone else. And so we can make decisions and have. I've made a decision just in a moment and been like, that's what we're doing. And now we're doing it. And so there's not a lot of layers of decision making. I've liked that for me, but I know that's not the right thing for everybody. And so that has been nice to not have a lot of voices in my head. Although I do seek a lot of input when I'm making a big decisions and I've had some this the past couple of years, I do care what, what other people have to say and what, what they can teach me about how to look at the decision. But then in the end, I do feel that I need to make the decision and not just do what everybody else is doing or what everybody else is telling me to do but I need to make the decision. And I feel like I've steered my own ship. Yes. And you can tell, and it takes a crew and it takes those who have gone before and paved that way that you are so good about reaching out to and gleaning from. But I love this idea of this constant partnership with Heavenly Father of guiding this particular journey of yours, because everyone's journey is different, even if you're in the same genre. And I see what you've done with this magazine and how it started out and how it's really impacted, especially Utah Valley, impacted the community. I feel it's brought it together. It's gathered it. What have you seen has been the impact of the magazine? Have you seen specific outcomes with that? I have. And it's really rewarding when people will say that because I was in the magazine or because I attended one of your launch parties and met other people in the magazine, this happened or this partnership or this investor or this idea or whatever came to be. I feel like I've been a little bit of a pollinator. I've been just kind of shining a light and letting people meet each other and throwing stories out there. And and I do feel like a lot of good has happened. I'll never know exactly what became of what. It would be kind of fun if all of us could have an It's a Wonderful Life experience. And yes. to see what, 
what our contribution, you know, has been. But I do, I do feel that. And I've attended a few funerals of people that we have featured and the articles have been brought up or displayed. And I feel that I've done some documenting, some family history, basically, for people of documenting some stories that needed to be put on paper and and shared and put into words. And that feels good. Uh, I also feel we we do a few different features every year. One of them is uh, high school students who will change the world. Yes. And so I've heard from a lot of parents that they love it when they're like junior high students read those articles and it gives them ideas of what, how to be that kind of person, you know, because the teenagers will talk about, I write in a gratitude journal every day, or I try to learn a new person's name every day. And it just shows you different ways of going to high school and being someone who gets the most out of it and gives gives the most as well. And and so that those moments feel really, really good to feel that we've made a difference and made the world a better place. I love that. And all those different kinds, if you have the women's issue, that angels among us, all those things, the little cute baby photographs thing. I love when you have the all the events issues so you can see what's out and about and it's in one place so that it's right there and I can go through it with my family and say, which ones do we want to do together? And I really do feel you are a gatherer. And I, I hope for people listening that can feel the value in that, that it doesn't have to be a stock price goes up or something. It, it really is about what value are you offering to people to gather, connect, improve the quality of their lives and, and be able to improve their relationship with the divine? So I think that's so marvelous. And you've had such a variety of people that you have spotlighted. I know this is so hard and it's the, the ugly question. Oh, what's <laughs> your favorite? But, uh, but as you think back on all of these people that you've interacted with, does any kind of a tender or poignant moment or an aha moment come to mind that you've had with the people that you've interviewed, just maybe one or two examples that come to mind. You know, a million, my life is flashing before my eyes right now. <laughs> <laughs> the past 24 years of <clears throat> interviews and great conversations. I will say that I've come to really enjoy interviewing people in the second half of their life because they've processed some things mm -hmm. and they're willing to talk about some, some failures some things that didn't go the way they planned but here's what they learned. Here's how they pivoted. And I really love that. It's fun to interview the young American Idol contestants as well, but they don't have quite the perspective on their life yet. And that's how it, that's how it should be, right? We put a bunch of dots down on our, on our life. And then we look back and go, oh, that's what that all meant. And so that is one thing that I've really enjoyed. And maybe it's my own age of getting older myself and, and really gleaning lessons from others. Uh, I mean, a couple that stick out, Lavelle Edwards, I interviewed him as he was retiring and he was sitting in his office that he was just getting ready to pack up full of accolades, full of trophies and photos and mementos and gifts and yet he emphasized the only thing I'm, I really care about and that I'm taking with me are the relationships that I've made. That's all I care about. No one's ever going to care about a score or a record or anything like that. It's just whether I connected with someone that was meaningful. Mm -hmm. Larry King, he interviewed Hillary Clinton the night before we had our interview and he treated me the same way that he treated her. And I thought that was remarkable. He acted just as interested in little old me <laughs> as he was in her. And I thought that was a really great trait and probably one of the reasons he was known as such a good interviewer is that he was able to really show genuine interest and love in others. I thought that was amazing. I've interviewed governors and, you know, we've, we've talked about big things, but it's when we get into the real stories of life that have nothing to do with accomplishments or headlines, really, that's where the story really is. You know, connecting a childhood experience with a fear overcome or an insecurity dealt with or continuing to be dealt with, that those are where really good stories come. It's yeah. actually kind of tricky to interview famous people because they're used to this is what I tell the media. This, this is my persona. And not that it's a facade, like it's, it's false. I'm not saying that. It's just more of like, here's the story that I've chosen to share. But I prefer to get kind of behind that. Yeah. Like, okay, but we already know that, <laughs> you know? Right. Yeah, yeah, but how does that really feel? And what are some of your thoughts about that? And that's what I've really enjoyed doing is getting to pe people to talk about stories they haven't thought about in a while and maybe to see them in a new light. Love that. Oh, I'm so glad you said it. It's a perfect segue to talk about our favorite thing to get back door as well, which is talking about the big win and the fabulous fail. What has been an experience in your life, especially as you have been involved with all these high profile people 
there's probably been moments that you've had a lot of big wins, but then you've had those fabulous fails, those moments where I don't even know if I can keep going in this or if I even want to. Can you start with either one of those, either a big win or the fabulous fail? Okay, so the fails are coming to mind first. So let's go there. <laughs> <laughs> so here's a couple. When we first started publishing for the Parade of Homes around the state and some outside the state. And so partnering with the Home Builders Associations, there were a few things we didn't know yet. And one of those was if we package things together and they weigh over a pound, your postage, it just, it's doubles, triples. Anyway, it was complicated. And so we had a huge, huge postage bill one time that we were not anticipating. So we had to adjust how we were doing it and mail it in two parts, which we also messed up. So we found out that we had done something incorrect and they had dumped all of our magazines in a dumpster. In And I went to that dumpster and I jumped in there and I am pulling them out. I'm like, we're going to salvage these. We're going to hand deliver these. We're going to figure this out. <laughs> so I'm there in a dumpster in like business clothes, you know, just like refusing to throw that away. That was too much work and too much money and kind of laughing and crying at myself at the same time, <laughs> you know, but sometimes it takes a failure like that to be like, okay, maybe I'll ask a few more questions next time. Won't make that mistake again. Yes. So that was, that was one, just the dumpster diving money. <laughs> but then also some of the, I would say fails have come in the complicated balance that I've tried to do imperfectly. So my son, who's on a mission now, and he's just a tender soul and I love him so much. But he was one who would say a few things. Like he said to me one day, mom, I love it when your hair's in a ponytail. Cause that means you're not going anywhere. It was like, oh, I haven't been home enough, you know, with you. The beauty of it is I am in charge of my schedule and I can work at home and take my kids and da, 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 da. But the reality is there's been a lot to do. And so at times I've been like, I am out of balance. Like I need to do more. So he would kind of set me right on things like that. He also was one who would throw balls at my laptop if I was on too long. I remember you saying a ping pong ball and you were like, he'd start throwing it at this screen yeah. and then you'd know, and I'm done. Yep. And here we go. So some of it was just that, you know, I, I moderated a governor's, and this is also Carson. It's funny that most of my stories are my middle child, my middle child that, you know, screams for attention. It, it is the bane of their existence. Let's just own it. Okay, go ahead. <laughs> so I was moderating a governor's debate when he was a baby, which was a huge honor, but he was a nursing baby. And one of the blessings God gave to me is none of my children would take bottles. I had to nurse them and all five of them nurse for a year. So it was my, it was God's way and my way of being like, I'm, I'm not going to go too far from this baby. This is going to slow me down. And it was good. But anyway, I'm in the car getting ready to go moderate this governor's debate in my red suit, nursing my baby to make sure he's <laughs> won't be hungry for the two or three hours. I'm going to be busy seeing all the dignitaries, the candidates, everybody walk past my minivan, you know, as I'm, and they're headed in. And I'm like, well, this is the life I've chosen and I'm doing the best I can, but this does feel a little odd. You know? <laughs> uh, so nursed him, handed him off to my sister-in-law for a little bit and, and put on the red suit again and headed in. And I don't know that I would call that a fail, but it was just a moment of like, I'm trying to do the impossible here. Yes, you know? absolutely. Oh my gosh. It makes me think I was invited to a PR tour, nothing like what you've been doing, but that moment where I said, no, I can't because the things I had committed with my kids. And I remember at that moment, remembering that they were going to be getting on the plane while I was sitting and reading a book to her and just thinking, I know I'm where I need to be. But there was that moment of these are, they feel like sacrifices at the time. And because it does impact what you do, but then there's that knowledge and that core understanding that the Lord, not only makes up the difference in that seemingly important thing, but he compensates us so much on the back end to give us other opportunities and other things to be able to still make a difference in people's lives. So I love that you are honest about those moments because every single creative will have them, man, woman, teenager, young adult. You'll have those moments where you go, ah, I'm missing something and it will feel like you are, but you're mm -hmm. not really. It's true. It's true. And there are hard choices. I have missed sometimes with my family that would have been nice to be there. I've missed business events. I feel like I probably could have built a bigger, better business if I had been willing to leave my kids a little more. I think I'm for the most part happy with the choices that I've made, but there are trade-offs. 
You know, I mean, I chose to have five kids that right there is something, you know, that just tells Mm. you that it's, you know, you're going to make some trade-offs. You're not going to go to some business conferences that you would like to go to. You're not going to be able to be gone as long at night or stay after to talk at an event. I still do that sometimes, but you know, (laughs) there's just trade-offs that you, that you make. Exactly. And I think for anyone listening, being clear about what those trade-offs are and where they lead, you know, Mm -hmm. where down the road, because I look at my kids now and I'm sure you feel the same way. And I don't regret any of those. I really don't. There were times that I did feel there were big opportunities that I had to turn down and you too, and not Mm -hmm. as big as yours, I'm sure, but just that it's all relative. Right. And, and yet at the same time, even in the daily work-life balance, even though balance is, you know, kick to the curb, but that idea of how do I give myself to what this calling feels like, and it is valid, and this calling of motherhood or parenthood, and being able to give them what they need, and then making sure they also have opportunities to stretch and grow and not feel hovered over either so that every jot and tittle is done for them. And mm-hmm. I, I want to jump to that for a second, how you've seen what you've been engaged in positively influence your family because I've seen that for myself, things they've learned from me almost by osmosis that I didn't know I was teaching them that have helped them to be successful in their own right. Have you mm-hmm. seen that, how it's impacted your family? I have, and I have another story coming to mind about Carson, <laughs> my little child is on a mission. I miss him dearly. So he's on my mind, but anyway, so I, a uh, little side story. I ran for a state Senate seat three years ago. And it was a crazy turn of events. It was a year I had just gone through the cancer journey. It was the year of COVID. I don't know. I got asked to run for the state Senate seat and I thought about it and decided to do it. And I didn't win. And it's all for the best. And I had a really good experience running and came in second out of six and, you know, learned a ton. Really glad I did it. Kind of relieved I didn't win in a way. But after that, Carson, he wrote me the sweetest letter and he said, mom, you showed me that it's okay to fail. And not everything has gone his way, like it never does for everybody, but it, you know, in sports and other things, some, some things just didn't work out for him. And he said, I loved watching you fail, get over it, be willing to talk about it. And it's not the end of the world. It doesn't mean you're a failure. It just means something didn't work. So, you know, the, so that leaves you other doors to explore. And the fact that he was watching that and getting something positive out of it, that was meaningful to me. I think my other kids, we've had good conversations about, about the trade-offs, you know, that we've talked about. And sometimes when we have a Sunday night meeting and we talk about the week and sometimes the month ahead, and I've sometimes talked to them about, here's a decision I'm trying to face. You know, there's, I've been asked to do this, but there's also this. And at times they've helped me think through it. And some of those decisions they've helped me make mean that I am missing something of theirs. I may be missing that family picnic we'd talked about or whatever. And, but they've, in helping me analyze it, are like, I think that the better thing for you to do would be to go to that, you know? So that's been kind of nice. And then one of my daughters studied public relations, graduated in PR, works at the magazine. And so she's learned a lot just from being around me. And I learned a lot from her. She has a, a fun, spunky personality and it's really good with people. And so it, the learning isn't just one way. I think yes. that, that they've taught me a lot too, which has been awesome. Love that. And you see the skill sets that they pick up that you didn't realize they were watching or learning from and how it's blessing their lives as they are going forward and making their way as young adults. I just think it's wonderful. It's just this beautiful cycle. And I love how you brought up to get the buy-in. Sometimes I think um, as creatives, we can make a mistake of trying to keep our lives parallel, like different, right? Like I'm here, there, and now I'm home here, there. Instead of this, yes, there's chunks that go back and forth, but we are woven together and getting that family counsel, that family buy-in so that they can feel like this is a family thing. I had met Henry J. Iring at a conference at Lead by Faith conference last week. And as we were talking, I just thanked him because I said, you know, it's a family calling. I mean, even though it's President Iring that's out there, that whole family is making sacrifices and supporting and all the things. And you think about that, what does that do to bond the family together? If you can approach it in that positive buy-in, let's all be involved in some facet together and be able to make this a family, sort of a family engaged venture. So I love that. So as we're you know, people are listening and I know we talk a lot about musicians and actors and things like this, this is business. People who 
are doing some kind of creative venture, at some point, they have to have that underbelly of a business. They, they have to have that understanding of how to get their message out, how to do it effectively, how to do taxes, how to do all these things, right? You have done so well in business and moving forward and learning so much and then sharing so much back with others, giving back in that learning and that knowledge. Are there any tips or tools, just a couple that you feel like, oh, if you want to either create a business or you need to add that business underbelly, here's some things to keep in mind. Anything come to mind? I think just having a basic business understanding is really important. So if you're at the point in your life where you're getting formal education, take those business classes, even if they're not required to have an understanding. So if you're going to go in and talk to an investor or a bank, which you know you will at some point or another, to have those understandings when they're like, okay, we need a P&L statement. We need what's your balance sheet so that you're not completely thrown. Because I think sometimes when we feel intimidated, we can make some bad decisions or get some bad advice because we're vulnerable in that moment. So you do need to understand some of those basics. I think one reason we were able to get the magazine off the ground in, in an illogical time and age of my of my life was that we kept costs so low. So I think that's one thing. A lot of times we think of businesses, how can we bring in revenue, but also keeping costs low. Those are the two metrics, bottom line, top line. And so, you know, making sure you're not overspending on an office space or on a staff, if that's something that you could outsource for cheaper or do yourself until that moment when you just can't do that yourself anymore. I think one of the reasons we were able to succeed, in fact, we adopted the philosophy of no hat building the cattle herd. You know, yes. We didn't have an office for the first couple of years, didn't have an employee until we like felt like we couldn't afford not to at that point. It was stopping us. Some of the office work was stopping us from doing some of the revenue generating activities. And so that's when it made sense. So I think that's really smart to just always keep your eye on that. I think another thing that's hard for creatives, and I struggle with this too, is sometimes we think with our heart and with our creative mind and we are almost stubborn about the business side because like this is what people should love this is what people should buy this is amazing oh the numbers don't back, back up. me up on that and and so there's a balance there because obviously you don't want to just chase every dollar and money's not the the most important metric but if you're trying to run a business numbers matter quite a bit you know, they tell you whether you get to keep doing what you love or not. Right. And so making sure you understand those metrics. And I've had to, you know, we were we were more journalistic in the beginning of the magazine. And I liked articles on the drought and legislative issues and water usage. Nobody's reading that. Nobody's sharing that. Nobody's talking about that. And so we had to pivot to be like, what do people really want to share? What were they willing to pay money to buy at the at the grocery store? And it was more people oriented and less news and less politics and all of that. And so, you know, we pivoted a bit to that. So it's finding that balance, check, making sure that you have both sides of your brain at work, your creative side, but also watch those numbers, watch those metrics, bring in revenue, keep your costs low. Find that ground so that you can do what you love. So, so good. And I know I let you've used interns and things like that that have been so helpful. And I've done the same thing where these young adults are so savvy and it's a great way for them to get experience. And you kind of hit this compromise of they get experience and you get a little bit less cost. And then you kind of grow each other up in a lot of ways and they have fresh ideas and you give them some sound savvy. Yes. So I think of those kinds of ideas, like you're saying, look for that third way, look for the creative solutions before jumping to what you think needs to happen in order to move this forward in a business way. Mm -hmm. I love that. Now I noticed that we kind of skipped over the big win. So we talked about some of those fabulous fails. I love, I love, but let's talk about the big win and what that meant to you. Not just like you said, not just an accolade or a thing, but what was something that was a big win for you that was meaningful, that really touched your soul? Like this mattered. Well, the one thing that comes to mind first is this year, Silicon Slopes chose to induct me into the hall of fame and you know, awards in and of themselves are a little embarrassing to me. I actually really prefer writing about other people. And it's like, oh, do I really deserve this? Blah, blah, blah. But what that particular one did for me is a lot of the CEOs that I've written about either said that night or on videos or sent notes of saying, you made a difference to me when you highlighted our company as a startup. And these are people that I'm like, I'm not even sure if they remember my name. <laughs> You know, but they were, but they were reaching back out and saying, you deserve this. You have changed the business community. 
that was really rewarding to me to feel like what I had done mattered because I didn't invent a tech gadget. I didn't write code to bless anyone's life, but I helped other people do that by doing what I do. And that was a really big win for me and my family. My parents came, my kids were were there and and I really made it like a family thing. We got a, a room at the Grand America that where, you know, so we could be there before, go down to the event, come back up, talk till two in the morning about everything that was funny that night, or did you like the dessert, or did you hear what so and so said? And we just sat there and laughed, got room service at, you know, in the middle of the night. And it was one of those moments where I was like, we really did this as a family and maybe what we've done has mattered. And along the way, we've also bought groceries and paid our mortgage. And this has also been a good farm, you know, a good farm of, of words and pages that we've grown together. That was rewarding. Mm, beautifully said. And I love how you just made that analogy that you can involve your family. You can involve them to a degree that everyone can feel the the ride of what you are leading them to. And, and quite frankly, almost every time I'm interviewing someone here, they say that same thing, that either their family influenced them and then they springboarded, or they were able to involve their family in some way. And then those kids have been able to be a part of it and actually helped enhance what they were doing. So I love this. As we're wrapping up our time together, this is just so tender. And Jeanette, I have been such a lucky recipient of so much of your wisdom over the years and just watching your example, especially for women in business and how we do this. If for women out there that are listening particularly, do you have any last thought or advice on how they can manage that sort of priority between personal and professional life? Is there anything that you haven't shared yet that's a guiding influence to you that's really helped you stay anchored and grounded? So this is what I'm thinking a lot about right now is this idea of how God created the world and he did it in creative periods. Mm. And, and I'm processing that and anticipating some, some other periods, creative periods in my life and looking at how God did it. And he didn't do it all at once. And I've sometimes tried, you know, I actually, and, and I've had failures and some successes at trying to fit a lot into one period, but he did it pretty systematically. And so I think sometimes as creatives, we feel like I have to do this all today. The The window is now. And when you have family demands and your creative juices over here aren't getting their full time in the, the sun, so to speak, maybe look at how our heavenly parents did it and look at it in periods, creative periods. And in the end, look what happened. We had this beautiful world, you know, full of animals and light and dark and humans and it all added up, but he did it in an organized way. And so I, that's, that's one thing I'm thinking about right now and how to apply that. And maybe that would be meaningful to, to some people to see how to apply that to their lives. I think we are meant to be creators. That's part of our divine fingerprint. And luckily we're all doing it differently. And that's what makes the world and our communities and everything so beautiful. Some people paint, some people write, some people create landscapes, some people create cities. And we need all those types of people to stay in partnership with heaven on what chapter you're in and, and the best use of your skill. The other phrase that I've been trying to focus on a little bit, and this actually came when I lost that Senate race and I had another talk with God of like, okay, I kind of felt like you wanted me to do that. It didn't work. Like, what was that all about? And one of the things that I felt like I got a download at that time was focus on things only you can do. Mm -hmm. And politics isn't that for me. Lots of people can do that and do it way better than I could. And so to have that little meeting with myself, what are the things only I can do? And there are a few of those, you know, especially as it relates to family and religious community and maybe some of my talents and network, there's things maybe only I can do. That should be our most important work. Oh, gorgeously said. And I think about that, of what you just said, of really partnering with the ultimate creator to know what day we're on and what part of that day is ours. And then being at peace that he's got the rest and we're only needing to focus on what's before us and what we need to do. I love this. We could talk forever. In yes, we chat, could. I'm sure <laughs> it has been pure joy. People listening are going to want to reach out and connect with you. What's the best way for them to reach you? Instagram is my favorite platform. So Jeanette Bennett on Instagram is great. And you can find me there or on Facebook as well. Fantastic. Jeanette, it's been a joy personally and professionally. Thank you so much for sharing your heart today. Thanks, Connie. 
And if you have loved this interview, like I have, then feel free to go back and listen to all the other interviews that we have, these wonderful creatives who have taken their time to share their ups and downs and in between. Steve Young, Jane Clayson Johnson, John Heater, aka Napoleon Dynamite, all these wonderful people who are sharing the good, the bad, and the ugly of their journeys to help you in your journey of being called to create. 